All right, this is chapter three for Number of the Stars today. Where is Mrs. Hirsch? The days of September passed one after the other, much the same. Anne Marie and Ellen walked to school together and home again, always now taking the longer way, avoiding the tall soldier and his partner. Kirsty dawdled just behind them or scampered ahead, never out of their sight. The two mothers still had their coffee together in the afternoons. They began to knit mittens as the day grew slightly shorter and the first leaves began to fall from the trees. Because another winter was coming, everyone remembered the last one. There was, na there was no fuel now for the homes and apartments in Copenhagen, and the winter nights were terribly cold. Like the other families in their building, the Johansons had opened the old chimney and installed a little stove to use for heat when they could find coal to burn. Mama used it too, sometimes for cooking, because electricity was rationed now. At night, they used candles for light. Sometimes Ellen's father, a teacher, complained in frustration because he couldn't see in the dim light to correct the students' papers. Soon we will have to add another blanket to your bed, Mama said one morning as she and Anne Marie tidied the bedroom. Kirsty and I are lucky to have each other for warmth in the winter, Anne Marie said. Poor Ellen to have no sisters. She will have to snuggle in with her Mama and Papa when it gets cold, Mama said, smiling. I remember when Kirsty slept between you and Papa. She was supposed to stay in her crib, but in the middle of the night, she would climb out and get in with you, Anne-Marie said, smoothing the pillows on the bed. Then she hesitated and glanced at her mother, fearful that she had said the wrong thing, the thing that would bring the pained look to her mother's face. The days when little Kirsty slept in Mama and Papa's room were the days when Lisa and Anne-Marie shared this bed. But Mama was laughing quietly. I remember, too, she said. Sometimes she wet the bed in the middle of the night. I did not, Kirsty said haughtily from the bedroom doorway. I never, ever did that. Mama, still laughing, knelt and kissed Kirsty on the cheek. Time to leave for school, girls, she said. She began to button Kirsty's jacket. Oh, dear, she said suddenly. Look, this button has broken right in half. Anne-Marie, take Kirsty with you after school to the little shop where Mrs. Hirsch sells threads and buttons. See if you can buy just one to match the others on her jacket. I'll give you some kroner. It shouldn't cost very much. But after school, when the girls stopped at the shop, which had been there as long as Anne Marie could remember, they found it closed. There was a new padlock on the door and a sign, but the sign was in German. They couldn't read the words. Wonder if Mrs. Hirsch is sick, Anne Marie said as they walked away. Saw her Saturday, Ellen said. She was with her husband and their son. They all look just fine, or at least the parents look just fine. The son always looks like a horror, she giggled. Anne-Marie made a face. The Hirsch family lived in the neighborhood, so they had seen the boy, Samuel, often. He was a tall teenager with thick glasses, stooped shoulders, and unruly hair. He rode a bicycle to school, leaning forward and squinting, wrinkling his nose to nudge his glasses into place. His bicycle had wooden wheels, now that rubber tires weren't available, and it creaked and clattered on the street. I think the Hirsches all went on a vacation to the seashore, Kirsty announced. And I suppose they took a big basket of pink frosted cupcakes with them, Anne Marie said sarcastically to her sister. Yes, I suppose they did, Kirsty replied. Anne Marie and Ellen exchanged looks that meant, Kirsty is so dumb. No one in Copenhagen had taken a vacation to the, at the seashore since the war began. There were no pink frosted cupcakes. There hadn't been for months. Still, Anne-Marie thought, looking back at the shop before they turned the corner, where was Mrs. Hirsch? The Hirsch family had gone somewhere. Why else would they close the shop? Mama was troubled when she heard the news. Are you sure? She asked several times. We can't find another button someplace. Anne-Marie reassured her. Or we can take one from the bottom of the jacket and move it up. It won't show very much. But it didn't seem to be the jacket that Mama, that worried Mama. Are you sure the sign was in German, she asked. Maybe he didn't look carefully. Mama, it had a swastika on it. He, her mother turned away with a distracted look. Anne-Marie, watch your sister for a few moments and begin to peel the potatoes for dinner. I'll be right back. Where are you going? Anne-Marie asked as her mother started for the door. I want to talk to Mrs. Rosen. Puzzled. Anne-Marie watched her mother leave the apartment. She went to the kitchen and opened the door to the cupboard where the potatoes were kept. Every night now, it seemed, they had potatoes for dinner and very little else. Anne-Marie was almost asleep when there was a light knock on the bedroom door. Candlelight appeared as the door opened and her mother stepped in. Are you asleep, Anne-Marie? No. Why? Is something wrong? Nothing's wrong, but I'd like you to get up and come out to the living room. Peter's here. Papa and I want to talk to you. 
Anne Marie jumped out of bed and Kirsty grunted in her sleep. Peter? She hadn't seen him in a long time. There was something frightening about his being here at night. Copenhagen had a curfew, and no citizens were allowed out after 8 o'clock. It was very dangerous. She knew for Peter to visit at this time, but she was delighted that he was here. Those visits were always hurried. They almost seemed secret somehow in a way she couldn't quite put her finger on. Still, it was a treat to see Peter. Brought back memories of happier times. And her parents loved Peter, too. They said he was like a son. Barefoot, she ran into the living room and into Peter's arms. He grinned, kissed her cheek, and ruffled her long hair. You've grown taller since I last saw you, he told her. You're all legs. Anne-Marie laughed. I won the girls' foot race last Friday at school, she told him proudly. Where have you been? We've missed you. My work takes me all over, Peter explained. Look, I brought you something. One for Kirsty too. He reached into his pocket and handed her two seashells. Anne-Marie put the smaller one on the table to save it for her sister. She held the other in her hands, turning it in the light, looking at the ridged, pearly surface. It was so like Peter just to bring just the right gift. For your mama and papa, I brought something more practical. Mama and papa smiled and raised their glasses. Papa took a sip and wiped the foam from his upper lip. Then his face became more serious. And marie he said, Peter tells us that the Germans have issued orders closing many stores run by Jews. Jews, Anne marie repeated. Is Mrs. Hirsch Jewish? Is that why the button shop is closed? Why have they done that? Peter leaned forward. It is their way of tormenting. For some reason, they want to torment Jewish people. It has happened in the other countries. They have taken their time here, have let us relax a little, but now it seems to be starting. But why the button shop? What harm is a button shop? Mrs. Hirsch is such a nice lady. Even Samuel, he's a dope, but he would never harm anyone. How could he? He can't even see with his thick glasses. Then Anne Marie thought of something else. If they can't sell their buttons, how will they earn a living? Friends will take care of them, Mama said gently. That's what friends do. And Marie nodded. Mama was right, of course. Friends and neighbors would go to the home of the Hirsch family, would take them fish and potatoes and bread and herbs for making tea. Maybe Peter would even take them something to drink. They would be comfortable until their shop was allowed to open again. Then suddenly she sat upright, her eyes wide. Mama, she said, Papa, the Rosens are Jewish, too. Her parents nodded, their faces serious and drawn. I talked to Sophie Rosen this afternoon after you told me about the button shop, Mama said. She knows what is happening, but she doesn't think that it will affect them. Mama thought and understood. She relaxed. Mr. Rosen doesn't have a shop. He's a teacher. They can't close a whole school. She looked at Pop Peter with the question in her eyes. Can they? I think the Rosens will be all right, he said. But you keep an eye on your friend Ellen and stay away from the soldiers. You, m Your mother told me about what happened on Osterbrogade. Anne-Marie shrugged. She had almost forgotten the incident. It was nothing. They were only bored and looking for someone to talk to, I think. She turned to her father. Papa, do you remember what you heard the boy say to the soldier? That all of Denmark would be the king's bodyguard? Her father smiled. I've never forgotten. It, he said. Well, Anne-Marie said slowly, now I think that all of Denmark must be bodyguard for the Jews as well. So we shall be, Papa replied. Peter stood. I must go, he said. And you, long legs, it is way past your bedtime now. He hugged Anne-Marie again. Later, once more in her bed beside the warm cocoon of her sister, Anne-Marie remembered how her father had said three years before that he would die to protect the king, that her mother would too. And Anne-Marie, seven years old, had announced proudly that she also would. Now she was ten, with long legs and no more silly dreams of pink frosted cupcakes, and now she and all the Danes were to be bodyguard for Ellen, and Ellen's parents, and all of Denmark's Jews. Would she die to protect them, truly? Anne-Marie was honest enough to admit, there in the darkness to herself, that she wasn't sure. For a moment she felt frightened but she pulled the blanket up higher around her neck and relaxed. It was all imaginary anyway, not real. It was only in the fairy tales that people were called upon to be so brave to die for one another, not in real life. Denmark. Oh, there were soldiers, that was true, and the courageous resistance leaders, who sometimes lost their lives, that was true too. But ordinary people like the Rosens and the Johansons, Anne-Marie admitted to herself, smuggling there, snuggling there in the quiet dark, 
that she was glad to be an ordinary person who would never be called upon for courage. Chapter 4. It Will Be a Long Night Alone in the apartment, while Kirst my mama was out shopping with Kirsty, Anne-Marie and Ellen were sprawled on the living room floor playing with paper dolls. They had cut the dolls from Mama's magazines, old ones she had saved from past years. The paper ladies had old-fashioned hairstyles and clothes, and the girls had given them names from Mama's very favorite book. Mama had told Anne-Marie and Ellen the entire story of Gone with the Wind, and the girls thought it much more interesting and romantic than the king and queen tales that Kirsty loved. Come, Melanie, Anne-Marie said, walking her doll across the edge of the rug. Let's dress for the ball. All right, Scarlet, I'm coming. Ellen replied in a sophisticated voice. She was a talented performer. She often played the leading roles in school dramatics. Games of the imagination were always fun when Ellen played. The door opened and Kirsty stomped in, her face tear-stained and glowering. Mama followed her with an exasperated look and, a set of pa and set a package down on the table. I won't, Kirsty sputtered. I won't ever, ever wear them. Not if you chain me in a prison and beat me with sticks. Anne-Marie giggled and looked questioningly at her mother. Mrs. Johansson sighed. I bought Kirsty some new shoes, she explained. She's outgrown her old ones. Goodness, Kirsty, Ellen said. I wish my mother would get me some new shoes. I love new things, and it's so hard to find them in the stores. Not if you go to a fish store, Kirsty bellowed. But most mothers wouldn't make their daughters wear ugly fish shoes. Kirsten, Mama said soothingly, you know it wasn't a fish store, and we were lucky to find shoes at all. Kirsty sniffed. Show them, she commanded. Show Anne-Marie and Ellen how ugly they are. Mama opened the package and took out a pair of little girl's shoes. She held them up, and Kirsty looked away in disgust. You know there's no leather anymore, Mama explained, but they found a way to make shoes out of fish skin. I don't think these are too ugly. Anne-Marie and Ellen looked at the fish skin shoes. Anne-Marie took one in her hand and examined it. It was odd looking. The fish scales were visible. But it was a shoe, and her sister needed shoes. It's not so bad, Kirsty, she said, lying a little. Ellen turned the other one over in her hand. You know, she said, it's only the color that's ugly. Green, Kirsty wailed. I will never, ever wear green shoes. In our apartment, Ellen told her, my father has a jar of black, black ink. Would you like these shoes better if they were black? Kirsty frowned. Maybe I would, she said finally. Well then, Ellen told her, tonight, if your mama doesn't mind, I'll take the shoes home and ask my father to make them black for you with this ink, with his ink. Mama laughed. I think that would be a fine improvement. What do you think, Kirsty? Kirsty pondered. Could he make them shiny, she asked. I want them shiny. Ellen nodded. I think he could. I think they'll be quite pretty, black and shiny. Kirsty nodded. All right then, she said, but you mustn't tell anyone that they're fish. I don't want anyone to know. She took her new shoes, holding them disdainfully, and put them on a chair. Then she looked at, with interest at the paper dolls. Can I play too, Kirsty asked. Can I have a doll? She squatted beside Anne-Marie and Ellen on the floor. Sometimes, Anne-Marie thought, Kirsty was such a pest, always butting in. But the apartment was small. There was no other place for Kirsty to play. And if you told her to go away, Mama would scold. Here, Anne-Marie said and handed her sister a cut-out little girl doll. We're playing Gone with the Wind. Melanie and Scarlet are going to a ball. You can be Bonnie. She's Scarlet's daughter. Kirsty danced her doll up and down happily. I'm going to the ball, she announced in a high pretend voice. Ellen giggled. A little girl wouldn't go to a ball. Let's make them go to someplace else. Let's make them go to Tivoli. Tivoli, Anne-Marie began to laugh. That's in Copenhagen. Gone with the Wind is in America. Tivoli, 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 little Kirsty sang, twirling her doll in a circle. It doesn't matter because it's only a game anyway, Ellen pointed out. Tivoli can be over there by that chair. Come, Scarlet, she said, using her doll voice. We shall go to Tivoli to dance and watch the fireworks. And maybe there will be some handsome men there. Bring your silly daughter, Bonnie, and she can ride on the carousel. Anne-Marie grinned and walked her Scarlet toward the chair that Ellen had designated as Tivoli. She loved Tivoli Gardens in the heart of Copenhagen. Her parents had taken her there often when she was a little girl. She remembered the music and the brightly colored lights, the carousel and ice cream, and especially the magnificent fireworks in the evenings, the huge colored splashes and bursts of lights in the evening sky. 
I remember the fireworks best of all, she commented to Ellen. Me too, Kirsty said. I remember the fireworks. Silly, Anne-Marie scoffed. You never saw the fireworks. Tilbury Gardens was closed now. The German occupation forces had burnt part of it. Perhaps as a way of punishing the fun-loving Danes for their light-hearted pleasures. Kirsty drew herself up, her small shoulders stiff. I did too, she said belligerently. It was my birthday. I woke up in the night and I could hear the booms and there were lights in the sky. Mama said it was fireworks for my birthday. Then Anne Marie remembered. Kirsty's birthday was in late August and that night, only a month before, she too had been awakened and frightened by the sound of explosions. Kirsty was right. The sky in the southeast had been ablaze and Mama had comforted her by calling it a birthday celebration. Imagine such fireworks, a little girl five years old, Mama had said, sitting on their bed, holding the curtain aside to look through the window at the lighted sky. The next evening's newspaper had told the sad truth. The Danes had destroyed their own naval fleet, blowing up the vessels one by one as the Germans approached to take over the ships for their own use. How sad the king must be, Anne Marie had heard Mama say to Papa when they read the news. How proud, Papa had replied. It had made Anne-Marie feel sad and proud, too, to picture the tall, aging king, perhaps with tears in his blue eyes as he looked at the remains of a small navy, which now lay submerged and broken in the harbor. I don't want to play anymore, Ellen, she said suddenly and put her paper doll on the table. I have to go any home anyway, Ellen said. I have to help Mama with the house cleaning. Thursday is our new year. Did you know that? Why is it yours? asked Kirsty. Isn't it our new year, too? No, it's the Jewish new year. That's just for us. But if you want, Kirsty, you can come that night and watch Mama light the candles. Anne-Marie and Kirsty had often been invited to watch Mrs. Rosen light the Sabbath candles on Friday evenings. She covered her head with a cloth and said a special prayer in Hebrew as she did so. Anne-Marie always stood very quietly, awed to watch. Even Kirsty, usually such a chatterbox, was always still at that time. They didn't understand the words or the meaning, but they could feel what a special time it was for the Rosens. Yes, Kirsty agreed happily. I'll come and watch your mama light the candles, and I'll wear my new black shoes. But this time will be different. Leaving for school on Thursday with their sister, Anne Marie saw the Rosens walking to the synagogue early in the morning dressed in their best clothes. She waved to Ellen, who waved happily back. Lucky, Ellen, Anne Marie said to Kirsty. She doesn't have to go to school today. But she probably has to sit very, very still like we do in church, Kirsty pointed out. That's no fun. That afternoon, Mrs. Rosen knocked at their door but didn't come inside. Instead, she spoke for a long time in a hurried voice, tense voice, to Anne Marie's mother in the hall. When Mama returned, her face was worried, but her voice was cheerful. Girls, she said, we have a nice surprise. Tonight, Ellen will be coming to stay overnight and to be our guest for a few days. It isn't often we have a visitor. Kirsty clapped her hands in delight. But Mama, Anne-Marie said in dismay, it's their new year. They were going to have a celebration at home. Ellen told me that her mother managed to get a chicken someplace and she was going to roast it, their first roast chicken in a year or more. Their plans have changed, Mama said briskly. Mr. and Mrs. Rosen have been called away to visit some relatives, so Ellen will stay with us. Now let's get busy and put clean sheets on your bed. Kirsty, you may sleep with Mama and Papa tonight and we'll let the big girls giggle together by themselves. Kirsty pouted, and it was clear that she was about to argue. Mama will tell you a special story tonight, her mother said, one just for you. About a king, Kirsty asked dubiously. About a king, if you wish, Mama replied. All right then, but there must be a queen too, Kirsty said. Though Mrs. Rosen had sent her chicken to the Johansons, and Mama had made a lovely dinner large enough for second helpings all around, it was not an evening of laughter and talk. Ellen was silent at dinner. She looked frightened. Mama and Papa tried to speak of cheerful things. But it was clear that they were worried. And it made Anne Marie worry too. Only Kirsty was unaware of the quiet tension in the room. Swinging her feet in the newly blackened and shiny shoes, she, clad, she chattered and giggled during dinner. Early bedtime tonight, little one Mama announced as she, after the dishes were washed. We need extra time for the long story, I promised, about the king and queen. She disappeared with Kirsty into the bedroom. What's happening, Anne-Marie asked when she and Ellen were alone with Papa in the living room. Something's wrong. What is it? Papa's face was troubled. 
I wish that I could protect you children from this knowledge, he said quietly. Ellen, you already know. Now we must tell Anne Marie. He turned to her and stroked her hair with his gentle hand. This morning at the synagogue, the rabbi told his congregation that the Nazis have taken the synagogue lists of all the Jews, where they live, what their names are. Of course, the Rosens were on that list, along with many others. Why? Why did they want those names? They plan to arrest all the Danish Jews. They plan to take them away. And we have been told that they might they may come tonight. I don't understand. Take them where? Her father shook his head. We don't know where, and we don't really know why. They call it relocation. We don't even know what that means. We only know that it is wrong, and it is dangerous, and we must help. Anne-Marie was stunned. She looked at Ellen and saw her that her best friend was crying silently. Where are Ellen's parents? We must help them, too. We couldn't take all three of them. If the Germans came to search our apartment, it would be clear that the Rosens were here. One person we can hide, not three. So Peter has helped Ellen's parents to go elsewhere. We don't know where. Ellen doesn't know either, but they are safe. Ellen sobbed aloud and put her face in her hands. Papa put his arm around her. They are safe, Ellen. I promise you that. You will see them again quite soon. Can you try hard to believe my promise? Ellen hesitated, nodded, and wiped her eyes with her hand. But Papa, Anne-Marie said, looking around the small apartment with its few pieces of furniture, the fat stuffed sofa, the table and chairs, the small bookcase against the wall, you said that we would hide her. How can we do that? Where can she hide? Papa smiled. That part is easy. It will be, as your mama said, you two will sleep together in your bed, and you may giggle and talk and tell secrets to each other. And if anyone comes... Ellen interrupted him. Who might come? Will it be soldiers like the ones on the corners? Anne-Marie remembered how terrified Ellen had looked the, other, the day when the soldier had questioned them on the corner. I don't really think anyone will, but it never hurts to be prepared. If anyone should come, even soldiers, you two will be sisters. You are together so much it will be easy for you to pretend that you are sisters. He rose and walked to the window. He pulled the lace curtain aside and looked down into the street. Outside, it was beginning to grow dark. Soon they would have to draw the black curtains that all Danes had on their windows. The entire city had to be completely darkened at night. In a nearby tree, a bird was singing. Otherwise, it was quiet. It was the last night of September. Go now and get into your nightgowns. It will be a long night. Anne-Marie and Ellen got to their feet. Papa suddenly crossed the room and put his arms around them both. He kissed the top of each head, Anne-Marie's blonde one, which reached to his, his shoulders, and Ellen's dark hair, the thick curls braided, as always, into pigtails. Don't be frightened, he said to them softly. Once I had three daughters. Tonight I am proud to have three daughters again.